had we been in the period of social media, internet, TV, camera, etc., etc., I venture to think the possibility existed that the recent wedding that got over two billion visitors um, would have been second place to what happened on that original Easter. The recent wedding that everyone knows about all over the world, everyone was focused in on that event. The issues that led up to that event, the preparation for that event. But that event is minuscule, as wonderful as it was, compared to this story. Jesus ending eternal death. Jesus coming back to his friends, his disciples. Jesus no longer in the tomb. Jesus appearing to his friends, even though they know three days prior he died on the cross. And you would think that would be appropriate. But I wonder, if it happened today, would the cameras of the world be on that tomb? Or would they be in that upper room, focusing on such a simple message that he gives his apostles peace? And that's the message he comes back to give us after he has resurrected. Peace be with you, he says. And yet, if we look at the 2,000 or so years that have passed since that original event, how much of an effect has it had on the world? Not only the early Christian community, but the world. And so we need the message continuously because it hasn't quite made its mark yet that Christ's peace is our gift from the Father, that Christ's peace is eternal, that Christ's peace is achieved, well, we know how it's achieved. We go back to the Acts of the Apostles. The author is Luke. And Luke ideally is tracing the birth of the early church and almost as if he's following another diagram tracing the birth of Jesus and his ministry filled with the Holy Spirit from his gospel, Luke. And now in volume two of his work, Acts of the Apostles, traces the birth of the church and the Holy Spirit's presence in the life of the church. And to give us um, a contract, to give us a constitution, to give us uh, a foundation of what the church should be like, we don't know if this, this piece from, from the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2 was authentic, a reflection, or was his proposal as to what the church should be like, the church inspired by the Holy Spirit. The people of the church devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. Teachings, the Word of God. The people of the early church devoted themselves to communal life, to respecting each other. The people of the early church devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread, which has been come to be called the Eucharist or Mass. The people of the early church prayed for one another and they shared one another with each other everyone who had anything, they laid it at the feet of the apostles so that those without could certainly share. And if you think about the life of the physical church since that first Pentecost when this reading took place, you might say in many areas of the world we have done that. We come together and we pray for each other. And we realize that we can't do it only in the physical context of the building of the church. We do come together and we pray for one another, whether it's because of a tornado or a tsunami or an earthquake or immediate death in the, in, in the neighborhood. We do come together 
in communal prayer. So our foundation, as it is now, built on the word of the Acts of the Apostles and the actions of the early church, goes on. It still goes on. So what you're doing, what we are all doing today, and so Christ returns in glory, is trying to get the facets of the early church and live it out. And the message that was rooted in that early church is the resurrection of Christ and the peace he gives to all of us. They ate their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all people. Well, that ain't so much happening because we still have to be in this world a thorn in the side of the world. So all people don't automatically look at the church and us, the body of Christ, the Christians who inhabit the church, and say, wow, aren't they great? Look how they love one another and look how they forgive each other and look how they don't talk about each other and look how they take care of each other. Some people outside the church may say, you know, that ain't going on all the time. It's here and there, but it's hit and miss, but it's not all the time. So we know we have work yet to do to have people outside the church, whoever they might be, look at us as a joyful community. So that means individually, every one of us has to take the word of God and Jesus' message of peace into our own hearts and live that peace out. You can't leave it to the pastor. You can't leave it to the music minister. You can't leave it to the servers. We are members of the body of Christ. And his gift of peace came to all of us so that we, according to the Acts of the Apostles, can live out our life as Christians in the early church and live it Now, in the 21st century, our life is Christians. And that that takes a lot of work. It means I can't be greedy. Well, ideally, Luke said, people who had of their abundance, they laid it at the feet of the apostles so that those who did not have could eat and could find clothing and could find shelter. So that means greed in all aspects of it in my life has to be pulled away. And that means envy, you have and I don't have, has to be removed. And that means lust. And whatever you lust for, whether it's money or sexuality or power, has to be removed from the church and be replaced with the message of Christ, which is peace. To be at peace with ourselves. It is going to involve doubt. It is going to involve us walking alongside the twin, Didymus, Thomas. Thomas needed to to be there in that upper room the second time. He needed to not be there the first time. Because you and I are walking along, Thomas. The name means the twin. He's not necessarily a twin. That's what his name means. So on the other side of that dual relationship is us, as the other side of Thomas. We're his twin. And we're not always going to take the word of another person in charge that God is good, that God heals, that God forgives, that I must act out of charity and love and share. We're not always going to take the word. So we should have doubts. And doubt leads to research. And research leads to to discovery. And so Thomas, we're right with him. Don't forget, this is the Thomas who had a few dialogues and a few key points in the scriptures. And this is the Acts, excuse me, this is the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, is what John tells us. This is the end of that story. This is actually the last chapter that John the Evangelist wrote. There is a chapter 21 that was added to this. 
later on before the whole gospel was circulated. You can read that on your own. That's why he concludes this section. There are many things that Jesus did and the signs he did that are not recorded here because there wouldn't be enough books for everything to be recorded. But let's stay with where he is. John himself concludes the gospel through the mistake, through the doubt of Thomas. And Thomas comes forward and represents us when we have the doubts, when we have the greed, when we have the self-centeredness, when we have the blaming. That's the other side of us that really doesn't respond 100% to the resurrected Lord's message of peace and mercy. So Thomas comes on the scene and says, I didn't see him. I didn't see him. I have no idea that he's alive. Unless I stick my fingers in his side. But this is also the Thomas who a few chapters before in the Gospel of John says, when Jesus says, we've got to go to Jerusalem because Lazarus died, and the other apostles say, no, 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 don't go there because, because you know, they're after you. They're going to kill you. And, and who wants to run away? Who says, let Jesus go someplace else? And Thomas says, no, no, no. If we're going with Jesus, let's go with Jesus and let's die with Jesus. So this is no, like, half-baked apostle. This is an apostle who had his, his grounding in Jesus. So he wasn't going to just take another person's word for this Jesus that he would have died with. And so we needed to know that he wasn't there at that first appearance. Because things aren't what they always appear. We need to go through reflection. We need to go through some doubt. We need to go through some examination of our faith in order to arrive at the presence of God holding on to us and God revealing himself to us. It's not easy, whether you're married or single, whether you're a priest or whether you're a child, it's not easy to live the Christian life as the Acts of the Apostles very nicely says everybody was getting along, everybody was having a good time, people outside just looked at them and loved them. Ain't ain't the way, you know that ain't the way. People give you my look, you're left and right. You have something I want, I give you my look. Oh, that's the evil eye, that's the devil, you know, the Italians do, you know? They, 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 you know that. And oh, and how, how many of us do this? Oh, it's her fault, his fault, them's, their fault, God's fault, the weather's fault, the Pope's fault. We rarely do this. It's my fault. For my lack of happiness, my lack of acceptance of the message of peace. So, so Thomas not being there was very, very important for us. And when he goes back, and, and John very carefully stages this, this memory that he records that Thomas wasn't there, but then he was there the second time, and Jesus appears. And they're still there, locked up. And he says to Thomas, go ahead, put your hands, stick them. It's not a ghost, it's me. And so the struggle, you can see the struggle in Thomas's head, his heart, all coming together. And what does he do? And, and John is careful to record what he records because it's very important for the people listening to that gospel for the first time and the people 21st century listening to the gospel. My Lord and my God. When John penned this gospel, he knew that the emperor, his name was Domitian, forced people to call him Deus et Domine. Lord and God. And John is saying, we put a lot of things in front of us that we choose to be our Lord and our God. And greed and anger and hate and, and, and control and all those others are some of those things that we put in front of us to be our Lords and our Gods. This is the one. This is the one who is our Lord and our God. The one who gives us peace. And it's not going to be an easy, easy peace. It's not going to be a peace, oh, Jesus is a ride, okay, let's go. Well, he's, he's, a, he's a, a, a rose from the dead, let's all, you know, march on, on his tails into victory. No. And Paul makes it very clear 
when we hear his letter, we believe it's written by Paul. It's possibly not. But it, it, for our sake, it, it's important that we just listen to the words because it's a baptismal, it's a baptismal letter. Excuse me, I said Peter. It, it's a baptismal letter. And, and he's encouraging the people who just received baptism to, to enjoy themselves in their new life. And he says, even though you do not see him, you believe in him. Rejoice with undescribable, glorious faith that you have him. But your life will still be filled with suffering and trials. So that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be proven to be a reflection of God's glory. So nowhere in the, nowhere in the scriptures is it said, except in that first scene of the Acts, and we've got to put that into perspective, be a Christian, say hello to everybody, love everybody, and everybody's going to love you back. Ain't the case. And Peter said that as people came out of the fonts of baptism, or the author of that letter of Peter, as they came out of the fonts of baptism, he said, you're wonderful today, you're sparkly clean, you're happy, people are giving you gifts, people are, your oils of the of, uh, chrism is on your head, and you smell nice, and you look nice, but watch out. As soon as you get into the world, there's danger out there. There's the way of the world out there. People will try to manipulate you and control you and cause you to enter into sin. That's the reality of our risen Lord. See, he came out of the tomb, resurrected and appeared and gave peace. But don't ever forget, we can never forget, he got to the tomb through the cross. Without the cross, there would be no tomb. And I don't know what God's other plan could have been or would have been, but that's, the, that's what we do know. That even his own son comes to us, gives us himself, gives us examples, cures, feeds, heals, does all these wonderful things, and we say, thank you, God, and we nail him to a cross. And yet he comes back because God the Father has the last word and the first word. And he sends his son back to us. And he gives us his gift of peace. St. Augustine said, not seeing is believing. Through believing, I come to see. It's believing in the risen Christ that more and more will come to see his presence in our lives and the life of the world around us. This is the gift of peace he gives us. The challenge, despite all the odds, to bring his peace out there. To focus on coming together communally by prayer, by sharing, by loving, by forgiving, by celebrating the body and blood of Christ, his son. That's what makes us people who receive the peace of Christ. And you know what? as we are receiving his peace and opening ourselves up to his body and blood in the Eucharist, we can say, my Lord and my God, because he really is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word is God, and he still is.